It prevents a lot of people from low income backgrounds to actually get into the industry because you know there's an expectation that you will have a little bit of money before you're able to start so you'll be able to get the equipment the things that you need yeah hi guys this is the podcast of issues facing young londoners in conservation does everyone want to introduce themselves um hello everyone <laughs> um i'm max um and today I will be discussing the topic um, of lack of entry level jobs. I'm Lauren, and uh, today I'll be going over the topic of coronavirus. I'm Eden, and today I will be discussing ageism. And I'm Zoe, and I'll be discussing money. Okay, Lauren, take it away. Um, so, obviously, in relation to our access to nature, um, coronavirus has definitely highlighted a lot throughout the pandemic. It's highlighted, obviously, the demographic differences in terms of money, race, a lot of different socioeconomic factors in kind of access to green space and nature, especially in cities. (laughs) Obviously, the difference between cities and outside cities is huge, but especially within cities, the difference between inner cities, suburban areas, richer and poorer full stop, and that access to nature and even having a garden especially in lockdown where people are literally required to stay at home which obviously we may be entering into again and that kind of idea that it underpins a lot of the segregation slash lack of access in conservation in general because with obviously less inspiration growing up or less access in general people are more disconnected from the industry which makes it a lot more difficult for to overcome those barriers and get engaged with those things that often quite information dense and require quite a lot of like lifelong learning and discovery to have a really heavy knowledge base rooted in that. So any thoughts on that? I, yeah, I completely agree with you. I think, um, I think all of us will agree over lockdown, um, people's kind of um, interest in nature and um, appreciation of nature definitely skyrocketed definitely. and I think um, you saw like I think we all saw green spaces especially in London being used a lot more mm. um, but I think it also kind of um, highlighted the fact that some people even in London um, which is a really green city um, there is that lack of nature yeah. around on your doorstep yeah, um, yeah. the way I live in in East London there there was one nature reserve which was highly um, had had really high yeah. high footfall, and almost the fact that it was crowded and yeah, I have the same yeah. Without a gas, I think it's definitely an issue that's been highlighted a, a lot more apparently over coronavirus. And obviously, as well, there's a lot less funding going towards the green spaces and charities with the recession coming up after the lockdown and the shutdown of the economy, which kind of is the catch twenty two of everything, which is kind of like threatening people's future access to it and threatening like the money availability in the sector yeah i definitely agree with what you guys are saying you know it's you know a lot of people don't have the kind of money to live in those sort of areas where you do have a lot of wide access to um green spaces and i think you know it it highlights the inequality definitely i think that also like knowing about where green spaces are in London is really lacking because like the reserves that we've been to as part of our traineeship like a lot of them are just in like really urban areas and like you turn down like an alleyway or something and there's suddenly a nature reserve like you wouldn't even think or know that it was there um so I think that um coronavirus has um allowed people the opportunities to um explore those places which is really really nice because like time having the time to actually explore and do things like that is really important but then also you're not supposed to be around people and things like that so it's really difficult to have that balance definitely I guess one thing I'd want to highlight from coronavirus especially in the conservation sector is that we've seen a lot of charities and environmental organizations lose funding um yeah yeah yeah, with the losing of money um you see that a lot of these jobs are going to be reduced and it's it's already hard enough to get in when you don't have the money because a lot of the entry points is volunteering yeah i think we've seen definitely over lockdown um 
lots of charities, like just off the top of my head, like London Zoo, um, London Wildlife Trust even, um, have all been doing big appeals um, for funding as lots of people had to focus on themselves during lockdown and not, not necessarily having the extra mm -hmm. money to, um, to give to these, um, these organizations that do kind of rely on donations. Um, so I think it's been kind of highlighted through lockdown how important um, money, 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 money is for yeah. the conservation sector. And yeah. it's definitely something that requires investment from usually higher earners who obviously had their uh, income capped at a relatively low furlough compared in comparison to their normal wages yeah. than lower wage workers, which obviously removes a big section of the people who can donate, which again brings it back to but money. Also, to that, also they, the time even that you yeah. have in your own life and where you sit on the career ladder to be able to dedicate that set time for free and sometimes at an expense to yourself to do something when a lot of people are again living within very tight budgets, very tight time frames. Yeah, like money is such a big thing in conservation, especially with like funding, because funding is how conservation works. And then like you having to use your time as like volunteering and stuff costs money, like with um, traveling to places. And also a lot of the time, like when you're volunteering, if it's abroad and you have to pay for those experiences, which is really um, quite sad because it, um stops pe um diverse people um being allowed to enter and access those spaces yeah it it prevents a lot of people from low income backgrounds to actually get into the industry because you know there's an expectation that you will have a little bit of money before you're able to start so you'll be able to get the, the equipment the things that you need is yeah I definitely agree with that in terms of the industry in general. There's definitely an expectation to be able to have the money and the equipment before you start. But I'd actually say in regards to volunteering abroad as well, that kind of comes into a whole different spectrum because to, to get that experience a lot of the time again, it is, again, there's like the, what I did a lot of in my degree, that kind of disguised ecotourism and volunteering which is completely corporate, yeah. completely corporately developed, completely for profit. And again, it's sad because a lot of these projects need to maximise on the money that they're bringing in. But those programmes aren't in the best interest for conservation or nature or the environment. They are a way to make money and a lot of people have caught on to that. And also it's that idea that it's, there's a lot of white saviourism, again, around the world globally and in a lot of these countries which do have the people very passionate and willing about protecting their local spaces, who have generations and generations and centuries and millennia of accumulated knowledge about these systems. And they are very often dismissed in the place of a rich, uh, a lot of the time Western volunteer or someone hoping to gain experience who replaces their right to that because they can pay a certain amount of money to the project and again it's taking ownership and guardianship kind of a form of neo-colonialism is in our environmental protection globally and this idea that we people a lot of the time local people and indigenous people who again have a very strong connection to these ecosystems are kind of removed from their right to protect that and engage with that at the expense of allowing kind of like rich westerners to come in and do what they've always wanted to do and build a connection with that at the expense of the people who really should be prioritized in those positions and the kind of stewards and guardians of them yeah that's a really interesting point i think um like from you know just from the volunteer perspective people to have been getting like you said they do they do kind of get some experience mm -hmm. um but i think as we probably all aware now that the conservation sector is kind of plagued with lots of volunteering opportunities um, and it does kind of generally end up that those people who do the volunteering opportunities will be the, one, the ones who are then hired for the entry level positions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I like, guess we can all agree, like over lockdown, we've seen all of these environmental charities and organizations struggling for funding. So they themselves are actually looking at probably making more redundancies rather yeah. than actually hiring new people yeah. when there was already um, a problem um, for entry level yeah. positions. Yeah. Um, Cause I know just from, like my own experience, like I graduated last like over a year ago, and I've been volunteering and also um, been working part time. But 
I'm still struggling to find that first entry level position. Um, just, it just shows you how competitive the scene actually is, especially in London, where people will actually want to move to London for those yeah. jobs, where yeah, exactly. maybe in other parts of the country they wouldn't yeah. necessarily move. Want to move, so there may be less competition out of, again, who happens to fall into the local area. Yeah. Whereas people... And also, again, people just have the access, the safety with a lot of communities. There is just a safety by numbers effect in London where you feel like you can slot into some sort of community more safely. You feel like you have more resources, less isolated, more connected to other people, which, again, when like relocating, depending on kind of your identity and how you may be treated by society, it, it can be very impractical for some people from certain social groups or backgrounds yeah. to relocate to specific places in the middle of nowhere. It's been really interesting, actually, how I'm sure, like, years ago, um, getting, like, a bachelor's degree was kind of seen as the thing to do to get into the conservation sector. But now it seems to have moved to the fact that everyone has a bachelor's. Um, so it's almost as if you have to go above and beyond what was expected I would say a few years ago. it's almost all practical and real-life experience-based now takes much higher precedent over a lot of higher education again because a lot of it is seen as like watered down kind of wishy-washy version um yeah so there's an expectation to have experience before you actually get into the sector which is it's difficult because you know people are coming from different places and just to be expected to volunteer and give up so much time and money is it's difficult for people especially like right now where there's problems in the economy so it's just it's just it'd be helpful if we could have more hands-on learning experiences within the sector so people can come in and have a learning experience while also probably getting some pay for it i think that would be really useful i think yeah, that also it's uh really dependent on what area you're in as well and how like many entry-level jobs you have so like where i lived in, in kent like every single job was like taken so quickly just because there was a lack of them and so many people already had experience because it's like called like the garden of england and stuff like that so with entry-level jobs like people who are overqualified are taking them and it doesn't let people that the young people that are um like for example in london to be able to get to those jobs which is a real shame yeah i totally yeah, agree definitely. and i think yeah. going back to zoe's point um it's always funny when you see the entry-level jobs with such a, a really low wage mm-hmm. um saying you need years of experience and it's, it leads to that conundrum being like you need the experience but how can you get the experience when no one will hire you if you don't have yeah. the experience yeah. to get an initial job anyway? Yeah. Well, it all comes back to that kind of like oversaturation of the job market thing, doesn't it? It's in cities, there's obviously a massive oversaturation of people flocking to cities to try and find opportunity. In the countryside, again, there's so few job opportunities that they're oversaturated with people who are often very highly experienced and those few positions get filled up with applications in both locations very quickly, just on different ends of the scale. And unfortunately, where that oversaturation comes, the people who are the best qualified are usually the first hired for understandable reasons. But there's less, there's a lot of gatekeeping in the industry in general because of that. And there needs to be more kind of, again, entry level, but restricted to entry level, real practical opportunities, again, for people to maybe be able to have pay and not necessarily be expected to eliminate whole sectors of passionate individuals just because of access to money time etc yeah and a lot of like the stuff that's um all the jobs that are like advertised are for people who already have that experience and it's because of like they've had though that amount of time because they're older and things like that which is which means that young people really push to the side um even in like volunteering and things like that a lot of it's usually like tongue uh, targeted to like school age people who are like in primary school like kind of school or it's targeted to like uh, retirees that have time in like the weekdays to go and volunteer but there's nothing really for like young people who are like in secondary school or like in their early 20s or something like that which is really a shame because those are the people that are, we are the future and those and we can speak for ourselves mm. and we are the ones that are going to be changing things and pushing especially with like gen z and stuff like that like we're the most knowledgeable about like things that are 
um, going on in the world that are like problems and like we're like the most ecologically um what's the word um knowledgeable and um advocating for these things um I think also that like um as people who are like leading volunteer um ships that like when we're trying to show our knowledge like people assume that we don't know what we're talking about just because we're young um have any of you had any like experiences with that before yeah I think what you're saying especially like I think more so as a 20 something even to like teenage because again I think like you said there are there aren't enough opportunities compared to primary school necessarily at teenage age but there are definitely I'd say quadruple the amount of opportunities as soon as you get through the point where you should have gone through the education system that is where the opportunity cuts off and then I think that's where people definitely stop listening to because you're not actively engaged in education so people what aren't as receptive to listening about what you're learning actively at that time but if you're learning it through your own research and kind of own experience again I think like what you said I think it comes back to people being very dismissive of 20 somethings especially because you're expected to kind of have have this set path but again like we're saying on the entry level part and the issues there yeah I think again it's that thing of like it's a weird window. I think it's like you were saying, a 20 something window. I think it stretches even like, I think it's more of an overlap between like almost like millennial and Gen Z. It's like mm. the window where you're too young to have an insane level of high level experience in the field, which has really accumulated all your knowledge and the education stuff. I feel like it's once you're outside of the age range, the average age range of the kind of typical uni student. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think one of the hardest gaps to find inclusion or opportunity in. And I think it's a yes. lot harder than even younger ages, even leading up to 21, where, again, there are still positions targeted towards that demographic. If yeah, that makes I, sense. yeah, I agree. I think um, back to like, the whole point of ageism, I think when I first came to London and I started volunteering, um, it was really weird for me because I... I was definitely the youngest person there. Um, and most people there were double, even, even triple my age. Um, and it's the whole, comes back to the whole thing is, they're like, oh, what are you studying? I'm like, well, actually I graduated last year. Yeah. Um, and it, it comes back to the whole point that Eden said, um, that they actually assume that you don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, oh, bless. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, actually, yeah. I'm an adult at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually working to what I want to be in Achieve. my future. Yeah. Um, but it's always they always want to find out what your end goal is yeah um, but not yeah. they might not have had an end goal themselves yeah. at that age and it's not necessarily an interest in who you are what you are capable of at this time more in where will you go what will you do what yeah. have you done rather than any value in yourself at that current time for what you yeah. are like, yeah yeah definitely that kind of attitude that they have it definitely deters people of our age to actually try and get in so even with the volunteer days you know it's because when I was volunteering at Kidbrook we did have a large mo most people were you know older and white for that matter and it's just like it just did deter people because they were sort of talking to us as though we were a bit like oh you're so cute and so sweet <laughs> like we we also kind of know what we're doing. We've been, you know, volunteering longer than you have even. So it was kind of, you know, a bit of a deterrent for us. And I, I suppose it is deterrent for most people trying to get on. They just don't feel comfortable working there. I definitely they, agree yeah. with that. I, I hundred percent, honestly, I agree with that so much. All the yeah. experiences I've had volunteering in conservation settings have been almost identical to both of you. It's been that thing where, again, it's kind of that question about what are you studying? Like, uh, lack of speaking to you as a person on a level and more yeah. of addressing you as a lesser party or a party doesn't understand to the same level of information that the rest of the volunteers will understand. And I think that is disheartening because people don't want to be patronised. Yeah, I think this whole discussion has been really interesting. Um, I think it's been really interesting how all these topics have linked up so well and that there's so many similarities and 
I think it shows how everything is connected and it's more of like a holistic view of things. You definitely have. So I guess from each leader of each discussion, um, I would love to find out, especially for the listeners, what is one thing you would love for someone to take away from listening to this podcast today? I'll start with you first, Zoe. Um, just the idea that, you know, everyone else is experiencing things that you may have experienced. So don't worry too much about it and, you know, keep going, keep staying strong. Eden? I think that even though we come from like different walks of life, the fact that we all have like really similar experiences shows that we're not alone. And if hopefully we use our voices together to tackle these issues, then we might be able to find a solution for those. Lauren? Um, Yeah, I just think it's, again, being holistic and really when we're facing these issues of access, et cetera, in areas such as conservation, especially where it's so prevalent, that you do really need to understand how inextricably linked and how intersectional all these different factors impacting upon Mm. the access of the industry are, and to really understand a more holistic view of where those barriers are arriving from and the factors that are influencing them to better understand how we can kind of try to mitigate those and overcome them. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think I would just like to conclude that um, if there's any, been young, any young people listening who have kind of resonated any of the points that we've said today, um, that you're not alone. And like Eden said, this experience is something that we've all shared. Um, yeah, thank you for listening today. I hope you've learned something. Um, and I hope, if not, at least it was an interesting discussion to listen to. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that goodbye was so... Yeah.